Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be discussing things to consider in your cancer patients and commonly recognized emergencies that you need to be familiar with. To start off with, we all know that cancer is very bad, and it's bad for a lot of reasons. But one of the things that it does to the body is as it grows, it tends to invade tissues. And as it gets bigger, it can either cause obstruction of things like blood vessels or bowels or things like that. But it can also destroy things. And so this can lead to bleeding or release of enzymes that aren't necessarily supposed to be where they end up. And so it can cause a whole lot of problems that aren't very typical for other patients that don't have a mass growing in their body. There's mainly two types of cancers that you need to know. There's solid tumors, which are mostly what I was just referencing. These are the ones that are space-occupying lesions and tend to grow and cause obstruction and destruction. And then there's hematologic or blood cancers that mostly stay in the bone marrow and cause problems with red or white blood cells or platelets. And they're a little bit different in the way that they manifest themselves. Remember, as you're approaching your patients with a history of cancer or with active cancer, this is a very scary condition, and there's a lot of emotional feelings tied up in this. And so these patients can be very scared and are going through a whole lot, and it's a difficult time in their life. So just remember to be kind. Take your time. Sit down. Talk to them. Ask them what's going on, how they're feeling, and kind of meet them where they're at. But in the back of your mind, remember that they are prone to more emergencies, and so you need to stick to the basics. It's not important that you know every medication that they're on, or even if you don't even recognize the type of cancer that they have, it's okay. What you're going to do when you approach these patients is just address their chief complaint. So if they're short of breath, treat it like a normal short of breath patient. Abdominal pain, treat it like normal abdominal pain. Back pain, same thing. Don't be scared just because they have cancer. You know how to treat the chief complaint and how to address it and evaluate it. So just continue down your normal algorithm for this, but then keep some of these other things in the back of your mind. So when you're taking your history, it's important to ask what kind of cancer they've had. So going back to that, is this a solid tumor? Is this a hematologic tumor? It'll help you evaluate what you want to do and how you want to approach this patient. Another important question is, are they currently undergoing treatment? What kind of treatment are you on chemotherapy that's going to make these patients more prone to infection or to bleeding? Or is it radiation that's going to have more effects on the soft tissues? When was the last treatment? This is going to be important for when you get to the hospital because guaranteed you'll be asked about this. Ask your patient if they have any tubes or lines or drains present in their body to drain any fluids. And then very importantly is ask them about code status. And it's fine if if they don't, but it's going to be important to know if they have any advanced directives about the way that they would like their care to go. Sometimes in our cancer patients, they feel like they've been robbed of any control over their life. And this is one area where they can have some control and we want to treat them how they want to be treated. And so evaluating code status early on is very important. Realize that some of the emergencies that we're going to see can be either related to the cancer itself or to the treatment. So a common complaint for cancer patients is chest pain and shortness of breath. We deal with this all the time. Same thing, you're going to get a good set of vitals, get a 12 lead. Things to think about, though, as you're evaluating these patients, I would listen to their heart tones. They are at increased risk for pericardial effusion, which is just fluid that builds up in the sac around the heart and if the too much fluid builds up in that pericardial sac it makes it really hard for the heart to fill you can see here that this weaker right ventricle here as the fluid fills up in the sac it pushes the right ventricle and has a hard time filling and so that can ultimately lead if not treated or recognized to cardiac tamponade which is a obstructive type of shock And so these patients will be hypotensive. They may have jugular venous distension as that venous blood that's trying to come into the right ventricle backs up. You're going to see it back up into their neck. And you're not really going to be able to hear heart tones because it's like you're trying to listen through a well. Every patient that I've ever seen that's had a really bad pericardial effusion or tamponade 
their main complaint is not chest pain, but their main complaint is trouble breathing. They're going to be incredibly short of breath. They're going to be sitting up. They'll be tripoding, and they'll usually be tachycardic. So in your patients with a cancer history and severe trouble breathing, this is something to ask yourself if this could be happening. And one of the clues that you're going to see is on your 12 lead. It's called electrical alternance. And if you look really closely at the morphologies of these waveforms, you see a big QRS complex here and then a small one and then a big one, small one, big one, small one, big, small, big, small. It repeats and that what you're actually seeing there is the heart itself swinging back and forth inside this fluid filled sac and so on these big QRS complexes it's where it's coming closer to the chest wall so it's being picked up but as it beats it swings back away from the chest wall and the next beat looks small and then swings forward kind of like a pendulum in the chest and that's called electrical alternance. These patients will typically be very tachycardic, and sometimes due to the fluid, if if um, if they have a large chest wall or a large accumulation of fluid, the voltages are going to be kind of uniformly small too because the fluid's not going to allow their probes to detect that much electricity through the through the volume of fluid around the heart. Not a lot to do for pericardial effusion in the pre-hospital setting other than recognize that it might be there. Same thing with pleural effusion. This is just fluid instead of collecting around the heart. It collects around the lungs. It builds up to the point that it can collapse the lung. Frequently, patients with lung cancer will experience this, and sometimes they'll even have a drain that's permanently in their chest to keep this fluid out of there so the lung can stay inflated. On these patients, when you're evaluating them, they may be increasingly short of breath, and you may have absent lung sounds on one side of the chest. Usually patients will tell you if they've had fluid build up in their lungs before. For this patient, just give them supplemental oxygen. We're not going to be able to drain any of the fluid in the pre-hospital setting. Just support their respiratory effort as best you can. Get them in a position of comfort and try to increase their oxygen levels as best you're able. Cancer patients are very prone to pulmonary embolism. It's one of the risk factors for PE. Things that you'll look for on your EKG are sinus tachycardia. They're usually universally tachycardic. Sometimes they'll have rightward axis on their 12 lead, so you'll be thumbs down in lead 1, thumbs up in lead AVF. Remember, if we use our thumbs to determine axis, you got your right thumb still in the air, so that's a rightward axis. You might see elevation in lead AVR and inverted anterior T waves in your septal leads here, so... V1, V2, V3 with the inverted T waves like you see here. So these are classic findings on a PE patient. Lung cancer in general um, causes two things that can be life-threatening and cause acute emergencies. We talked about cancer being destructive, so it's actually physically destroying lung tissue, which is making it harder for the body to perform its oxygen exchange with carbon dioxide. But the mass effect that it makes is it takes up space in the lung. It actually physically compresses, depending on its location in the body, it can actually physically compress like a main stem bronchus. And not only that, but as it invades, remember, it's easy to forget. I know I sometimes have to remind myself to think about it, but the lungs are incredibly vascular. Remember, they're doing all of this oxygen and carbon dioxide change with your entire blood volume and so the lungs have a lot of blood going through them at any given moment and as this cancer starts to invade frequently it invades into larger blood vessels and that can cause massive hemoptysis now there's not much to do for this in the pre-hospital setting but just realize that your lung cancer patients if they're presenting with a lot of hemoptysis you need to get them to the hospital as quickly as you can There's not a lot to do for this in the pre-hospital setting other than to try to manage the airway, keep the blood out of it, and um, start large bore bilateral IVs and try to support that blood pressure as best you can. If you do know that they have a mass that's obstructing a main stem bronchus, you can try to use CPAP. It's going to provide some positive pressure to maybe whatever part of that airway might still be open. Squeeze some air through there to get some oxygenation. Another important patient population to consider is patients with a history of head and neck cancer. Frequently, these patients have had very large surgeries or radiation to their neck. 
If you have a patient with this history, I would inherently expect a very, very difficult airway. And if I was in the pre-hospital setting without a very good setup, I would do my best to do basic life support for this airway and attempt CPAP if I can, but do everything I can to avoid a cricothyrotomy. Some of these patients who have had radiation before, they have really friable soft tissues with landmarks that are obscured and not going to be easily identifiable. This is a patient I would not try to do a cricothyrotomy on. I would try to support from above. But frequently, the problem is patients with head and neck cancer, they've had their entire oropharynx and upper part of their neck removed. And so you see this tracheal opening here if they've had a laryngectomy that means you can't support their airway from their mouth or their nose the only way to support their airway is from this hole in their neck so ask about their previous surgeries ask about the continuity of their airway ask about history of radiation or if there's any active ongoing tumors you can see here um, for those of you that are familiar with airways, you see your retinoid cartilage is here. Normally, you'd see vocal cords right here. You've got your epiglottis up out of the way, but there's a giant tumor overlying those vocal cords right there, almost completely obstructing that airway. That's a very dangerous airway situation, but it's not one I would want to deal with in the back of a moving ambulance going code 3. So your best option here is going to be provide as much supplemental oxygen as you can. If you need to give positive pressure, go ahead and do that to try to squeak air through whatever opening you can still find. And avoid cricothyrotomy if you can. Frequently, cancer patients will have neurological complaints or have altered mental status. Things to think about. Number one, seizures. Just treat these per guidelines. You've seen seizures before. Make sure you're checking a blood sugar. And give or set if you need to if the seizure is ongoing. If the patient has a history of cancer, suspect a tumor. Um, tumors tend to like to metastasize to the brain. can also be caused by infection or electrolyte abnormalities as well. So ask about any um, recent dietary changes, any profound vomiting or diarrhea, or any fevers. Sometimes tumors, if they metastasize to the brain, they can form abnormal blood vessels. And these are more prone to bleeding. And so sometimes your cancer patients, especially ones with known metastatic disease, are more prone to intracranial hemorrhage. And remember, we recognize these patients. Sometimes they'll be seizing. Sometimes they'll be altered. But typically, if they have a bleeding spot inside of their head, they're going to have a progressively declining mental status to the point where they're posturing and you're needing to manage their airway. So if you do have a patient that presents with this, make sure you're, you're ready to manage the seizure and the declining mental status with aggressive airway management. We've talked about cauda equina in our back pain assessment lecture, but this is an area where the cancer has in actually invaded the spinal cord and is involving the vertebral body here. And you can see that as the cancer is becoming bigger, it's pushed its way into the spinal cord that you see right here, and this is compressing nerves. And usually what your patient will complain of here is very severe back pain, obviously, because you can see the cancer is just literally eating away the bone. Also, they're going to probably have either leg weakness or some sort of GU manifestation of the compression of these nerves here. So that initially usually starts as urinary retention, but it may be loss of control or bladder or bowel, maybe leg weakness, and then sometimes it's numbness in the groin too called saddle anesthesia. Cancer patients receiving immunosuppressive therapy or chemotherapy, this actually kills rapidly dividing cells, and some of the most rapidly dividing cells in the body are white blood cells and our red blood cells that come from the bone marrow. And white blood cells combat infection, and if you don't have enough, you're very prone to infection, and so these patients can be susceptible to any kind of invader, whether it's bacteria, virus, or fungal. So ask about fevers and ask about infectious symptoms. One especially important thing to note would be any findings in the skin. If their skin break down, this may be prone to infection. But also we talked about chemotherapy killing rapidly dividing cells. Well, some of our most rapidly dividing cells are in our skin and in our GI, con in our GI tract. So look in their mouth. You can see here that these cells are just not able to keep up with 
the destruction and it causes really painful ulcers all along the GI tract. Sometimes yeast can take over, so these patients will have thrush. And not only that, but um, these patients might be more prone to shingles as well. And that's a that's a really red, painful, burning rash that tends to be in dermatomes on one side of the body. So make sure you're looking at these patients' skin, too, when you're evaluating for a possible infection. And another important thing when you're talking about skin and infection is to ask about lines and drains and tubes. If there's any pus or redness around those, it could be a source of infection as well. Like we talked about, the upper GI tract with the mucositis and the sloughing off of cells, the exact same thing can happen in the gut. And if the gut is losing too many cells and those walls become too thin, then bacteria from the inside of the intestines can leak into the abdominal cavity. And this causes something ca called tiflitis, which basically is a raging abdominal infection that has to do with chemotherapy and the death of bowel tissue. This can cause an overwhelming infection and is very important to recognize and get treatment for early. So your cancer patients on chemotherapy with abdominal pain and fever, this is something important to consider and consider them septic and start those fluids right away and get to, them to the hospital as quickly as possible. Hematologic emergencies, probably some of the most common ones we'll see in the field, have to do with the lack of platelets, which causes bleeding. Platelets usually help form clots and stop bleeding. But again, if patients either have a hematologic cancer or are undergoing chemotherapy, frequently their, patient, their platelet count will be very, very low and leave them prone to spontaneous bleeding. And so, just like any bleeding, the best way to control it is with direct pressure. So if you have a patient with a nosebleed, you just want to pinch the nose. Don't keep peeking. Just keep your pressure on there to make it stop, realizing that it's not going to stop as quickly as normal because they don't have enough platelets to form the clot. Sometimes patients will be coughing up blood or have blood in their GI tract. You can ask about that and try to quantify that. And then sometimes they bleed right underneath their skin. This is called a purpuric rash, and that's bleeding at the end of little tiny capillaries just due to arterial pressure, so it doesn't take very much to make these patients bleed. But this, if, if you see this on a patient with a history of cancer, you should suspect that their platelets are pretty low and they're very prone to bleeding. On the opposite end of the spectrum, with patients that bleed and their blood is too thin, if you have a cancer that causes too much production, usually of white blood cells, these patients, Patients are prone to something called hyperviscosity syndrome, which really just means thick blood that's more like syrup as opposed to fluid. And it causes overcrowding in the microcirculation, and it, you can imagine it causes problems in the smaller vessels and can lead to either stroke or heart attack, but sometimes can also cause bleeding. And so sometimes these patients can present with either a STEMI or a stroke or visual disturbances or neurological problems. The best way to treat this, if you suspect it, is to give IV fluid and try to thin that blood out. But of course, if you see STEMI, you treat for STEMI, right? You still give aspirin. That'll thin the blood as well. If you see stroke, you still want to cause a call a stroke alert. Treat what you see in front of you. But at the same time, realize that this could be the problem and you need to give IV fluid. Superior vena cava is an interesting phenomenon that happens in patients with uh, cancer in the top of their lung. You can see the superior vena cava drains blood from the head. And if you have a cancer or mass lesion in the upper part of the lung, it stops blood from being able to drain from the head. And so these patients' head will turn red as the blood backs up. And they get really puffy eyes. They get a swollen face. They get JVD. And it's all due to the tumor obstructing the flow of blood out of the head back into the heart. It's called the superior vena cava obstruction, or SVC syndrome. Sometimes it'll cause difficulty breathing. Sometimes it'll cause altered mental status due to cerebral edema. Since that blood has nowhere to go, it backs up into the brain and causes it to swell. So something to think about if you ever see this. Electrolytes are another big problem in patients who have cancer. Sometimes tumors themselves can secrete hormones that change 
either the acid-base balance or the sodium and potassium balance, which can lead to seizures or other profound electrolyte emergencies, namely hyperkalemia. Tumor lysis syndrome is a very important one to know about. This is where the tumor actually just causes massive cell destruction. And when cells die, just like in rhabdomyolysis, potassium is released. And potassium can be toxic to the heart. So you might see hyperkalemia in these patients. So if you have a patient with chest pain or shortness of breath and a history of cancer and fluid overload, make sure you're getting a 12 lead and evaluating for hyperkalemia because they could have acute renal failure and acute rhabdomyolysis from, from the tumors being lysed. Frequently, your cancer patients will have nausea and vomiting or be dehydrated simply due to their treatment or to just feeling bad. Remember that these alcohol pads are a really great way to treat nausea until you can get a 12 lead and evaluate that QTC before you give your Zofran. If they're dehydrated, go ahead and give fluid. This is a very common side effect of cancer treatment, but I would encourage you to treat with that inhaled isopropyl alcohol first until you can evaluate the 12 lead and then give Zofran. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, but make sure you try to broach the subject of advanced directives with your cancer patients with the emphasis on the fact that you just want to do and treat them the way that they want to be treated and give them some control over their treatment options. And it'll be important for the hospital, too, depending how sick and how much of an emergency this is at the hospital. Guaranteed, this is going to be one of the first questions that you're asked. So it's important to determine on scene what the patient wants in terms of their end-of-life care. All right, that's it for discussion of cancer emergencies. Just realize that there is a lot going on with these patients. They're probably going to be on medications you've never heard of before, and they might have a cancer you've never heard of before. It's okay. Just stick to the basics, take care of the ABCs, and address their chief complaint just like you would with any other patient. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I know the 7-8s will be happy to discuss this with you as well.